Mike Culver, director of the Wright Museum, and I'm joining you from the museum's new research library that contains approximately 3,000 books covering every aspect of World War II. I want to welcome you to the second program in the Wright Museum's 2021 Ron Goodgame and Donna Kenny Education Series. As always, we want to thank Ron and Donna for making these programs possible for the past five years. Their support enables us to bring you great speakers such as Joanne Cooper tonight. This is our very first program done via Zoom, and it will be the last program done with Zoom this season. All the other 19 programs will be live in our new and spacious Bitcoin Education Center. So we look forward to seeing you in the flesh sometime soon. There's a schedule of all the programs, all the 2021 programs on our website, and that website is rightmuseum.org. Several of you have asked about making a donation to the museum since there's no admission charge tonight. If you want to make a donation, this is the perfect time to do that because the Bieber Foundation has made a $60,000 matching challenge to the Wright Museum. For every $2 you give, the Bieber Foundation will give $1 matching up to $60,000. If you'd like to do that, go to the rightmuseum.org website and make the donation. When you go onto the site, you will open up and a pop-up will come up on the left and you simply click on that and it'll take you right to where you can make a donation. Or you can also mail a donation uh, via the mail and just make sure that you mark on your donation uh, Bieber Matching Fund. Don't forget that next Tuesday is May 18th. We incorrectly listed it as May 19th in our newsletter. We apologize for that mistake. But Tuesday, May 18th, next week, is the Tim Gray documentary, Remember Pearl Harbor. It's a wonderful film. We've shown it before. It's narrated by Tom Selleck, and it contains riveting interviews with servicemen and civilians who were actually there during the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. We're showing the film, of course, to honor the 80th anniversary of uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Please be sure to call and reserve a seat if you'd like to see that film, as you should do for any of the 2021 programs. Hopefully in 2022, uh, we'll have our beautiful, we have our beautiful new education center that holds 200 people, and we won't have to make reservations at all. Let's hope that that happens. In case you can't attend a program this, this season, or you want to recommend a particular program that you do come to, to a friend, uh, all of the programs are going to be filmed by WCTV, that's Wolfboro Community Television, as they always do, and uh, they'll be shown on their channel, and also the programs will be shown on the Wright Museum YouTube channel. Give us about a week after the program before it's available. Tonight's program is a presentation by Joanne Gilbert, author of Women of Valor, Polish-Jewish Resistors to the Third Reich. Joanne is going to tell you about why she undertook the research that led to this book. So I won't speak about that other than to say it's a wonderful book, full of the stories of exceptional women who should be known and recognized for their bravery and sacrifices. And it asks the important question, what would I have done? Because it is such a profoundly inspiring book, I'm sure there are gonna be lots of questions. You may type your question in the chat box down at the bottom of your screen anytime during the presentation. Justin, who you just saw, our curator here at the museum, will relay as many of the questions as possible to Joanne during a 30 minute Q&R period after her presentation. So please stay around to hear Joanne's responses. Uh, Joanne Gilbert is an award-winning author, editor, ghostwriter, and Holocaust educator who was born uh, and raised in Detroit, Michigan, and lived for a period in San Francisco Bay Area. In 2004, she relocated to Las Vegas in order to be close to her son and family. Since retiring in 2008 from a 40-plus year career as an educator, she has dedicated her time to researching, writing, and speaking publicly about the Jewish and Gentile women, women who successfully defied the Nazis. Her passion for this topic actually developed during a very young age, eventually becoming her life's work. And we're so lucky that it did. Please welcome Joanne Gilbert. Thank you so much, Michael, for that kind introduction. 
And thank you, Justin, for making the technology possible for us to do this via Zoom. I'm very grateful to all of the attendees who are joining us this evening as we celebrate women who actively and successfully fought back against the Nazis and their collaborators during what later became known as the Holocaust. I did become very interested in this topic at a young age. I didn't even know it was a topic when I was a little girl sitting on my grandmother's lap in Detroit and going through the photo albums she had brought with her in 1910 when she came from Vilna, Lithuania to Detroit. Most kids like to hear fairy tales and Snow White and Cinderella, but I only wanted to hear stories about the fabulous people I saw in her photos. And after each one, I would look at her and say, well, where are they? They're wonderful, we love them, where are they? And my grandmother would get tears in her eyes and say, Hitler got them. And I didn't know what Hitler got them meant. And so I just put that aside the way little kids do, thinking, well, maybe when I get older, I'll figure it out. But I understood at a very young age that people died and nobody helped them. And I grew up wondering, did my family in Vilna fight? Did anybody help them? And I'm so grateful that I lived long enough and that I was able to spend some time after my career in education ended finding the answers to those questions. Partisans in this context are like guerrilla fighters. They're regular, ordinary people who, when there was no longer any choice, ran to the forests carrying whatever they could or escaped the ghettos and ran to the forests and even escaped the camps. And they formed or joined ongoing partisan combat groups living in camps. There were also Jewish family groups and they were not combat soldiers. You may have heard of the Bilskis and they were both. They were combat and family residential camps. The women I'm going to tell you about were strictly in the combat partisans. I chose to tell you tonight about two women, not quite, in particular, first teenager, Faye Shulman, who if you look at my book cover on the left, is the second face in from the left. You can tell she's wearing a leopard uh, fur coat and hat. And the third woman or little girl is the second person I'm going to profile. And that's Miriam Brisk, who was just a child when she and her parents unexpectedly ended up in the forest with the partisans. The book on the right features Miriam as a child. After we finished Women of Valor, we thought, wouldn't it be lovely to spend more time on her childhood? Because all we know is Anne Frank. We don't know about a little girl who was a fighter. And Miriam agreed, and we wrote this book, A Victory for Miriam. And you can't really tell if it's a girl or a boy because to protect her as a little girl, they had to make her look like a boy. She always had short hair and she dressed like a boy, although they all dressed like that in the forest. And she was tough. She identified even at age seven and eight as a partisan. Perhaps you can see she's got a holster with a gun in it. For her ninth birthday, the commandant, the Soviet commandant of their partisan group told her, she was a real partisan and gave her a little gun that actually worked. She could take it apart and clean it and put it back together. And in her uh, late eighties, when we met, she told me if that gun were available now, she could still take it apart, clean it, oil it and put it back together. So I hope you enjoy learning more about these two very young women, a teenager and a little girl. Uh, screen share, right? Sorry, Justin. Yep, you just need to hit play in the top uh, top bar there, and right. you'll be all Sorry, awesome. I'm a baby boomer. I don't know technology. There you <laughs> okay. go. Thank you. With apologies. All right. The first very young woman of valor outside of my family 
who influenced me growing up was of course Anne Frank. I was taken by her writing ability, particularly with similes and metaphors. And while she was cooped up in that little attic, that dark attic, sometimes she would find a stub of a candle and go into a dark corner and light the candle and write furiously in her diary. And one of the quotes from that diary that struck me at a young age was, look, look at how a single candle can both defy and define the darkness. The darkness may be powerful, but just a single flame can defy it. It can show where it begins and where it ends. And it provided the light she needed to write and the light she needed to read. And her diary, all those years ago, has continued to bring light to millions of people who have read it. In my family, there was one person in particular that I always wanted to hear about, and that was Auntie Rivka, my grandmother's youngest sister. She was quite beautiful and very effervescent. She liked to sing, she liked to dance, and she also was a nursery school teacher. And when I was little, my grandmother would look at me, again with tears in her eyes, and she would say, you remind me of my sister Rivka. And if I did something, if I did a performance, if I had a recital, if I drew a beautiful picture, whatever I did, oh, just like Rivka. So when I was growing up, I, I kind of absorbed Rivka and felt like I was living the life she never got to live, which was a wonderful honor, but also a responsibility. And it kind of kept me from doing anything truly bad as a teenager, because how could I embarrass my grandmother who had been through so much and how could I betray the memory of our family that had been murdered. I also started learning about Hitler before most people uh, my age and uh, I learned about the Blitzkrieg September 1st 1939 when they bombed Warsaw. And I wondered along with everyone else, why did he do it? Yeah, he was crazy, but did he actually have reasons? And truthfully, he did have reasons. And one of them was to acquire more land so his master race could reproduce and expand. They were just too crowded in Germany as it was configured after the Versailles Treaty. He was mad that Poland had regained some territory uh, and that Germany wasn't as big as he wanted it to be. So Lebensraum, I don't know if I pronounced it correctly, was the belief, the philosophy that Germany had the right to expand as much as it needed to. And it didn't matter what countries fell in its path. The second goal was to absolutely destroy the Jews of Europe and then the Jews of the world. And Hitler was determined to make that happen. And fortunately, he failed, but it was at the cost of millions and millions of people. We have the number 11 million, but I think that's minimal. I think there were millions, millions more who never got in the statistics. One of the first things they did after checking out the population and learning who the useful Jews would be they would build concentration camps, thousands of concentration camps. Some of them are on this map. You can see the circles. Each of these had sub camps, many sub camps. They also had prisoner of war camps, slave labor camps, and excuse me, they had six death camps. Those are the squares. The death camps were very efficient ways of destroying anyone that Hitler didn't think deserved to live. So yes, it included Jews, it included Poles, it included professionals, it, can, it included um, the Roma, it included the handicapped, it might even include a few uh, Nazis that had displeased their Fuhrer. And so those six death camps were industrialization of murder. And he learned some of the process from his good friend, Henry Ford, who had industrialized the manufacturers of the automobile. They were very good friends. And in fact, in Hitler's office, he had a life-size 
oil painting of his buddy, Henry Ford, wearing the highest awards that Germans could give to non-German people. Many people thought the Jews went silently like sheep to the slaughter, but they didn't. There were many ways to resist. Some would fall under the category of passive resistance. And that would just mean they weren't burning, they weren't shooting, they weren't uh, killing anybody. They had other ways of resisting. And you can see in this window from 1933, Kiel, Germany, a very important port and shipbuilding area for the Germans who were preparing for war. In Kiel, Germany, that Hanukkah, and you can spell it any way you want because there are about 50 ways of spelling Hanukkah, it changes because the Jews live in so many different countries and then would take on the spelling that worked for that particular language. But for Hanukkah that year, a very brave family put a Hanukkah menorah, the candelabra used for Hanukkah, on their windowsill, even though the Germans were right across the street. Huge, huge risk, and they took it. There are other forms of passive resistance, just going into hiding, sometimes under the floorboards that might be two feet tall and hoping someone would bring you food. Sometimes they would create, uh, there would be a, a little pipe, an air pipe that would lead to fresh air somewhere else. Hygiene was very important. There weren't any stores to go buy soap. You weren't even supposed to have soap. So anybody that could figure out how to make it, how to save it, and how to preserve it so they could stay clean would ultimately survive a little bit longer because they wouldn't attract lice that carried deadly diseases. They also had to worry about the water because very often the water pipes had been broken. And sometimes the wells, the communal wells that everybody went to in the ghettos would actually have been poisoned or a dead animal thrown in. So keeping clean was very difficult. It was a very powerful act of resistance. In the camps and in the ghettos, just creating art, drawing pictures of what's going on around you, keeping a record, even making a toy rag doll or, drag, or putting rags together and making a jump rope or keeping diaries like they did in Warsaw with the Ringelblum archive. All of that was verboten. All of that was for, for forbidden. And it were, these were acts of resistance as were reading forbidden books. The Jews had already been required to turn all their books in so that the Germans could build huge, huge bonfires of Jewish literary history. The piles were higher than a one-story house. And it was a big party for people to come and watch the books burn. Kind of reminds me of in the South, when there was a lynching, how the local population would pack their little picnic baskets and come and watch the fun. Uh, the forbidden books were not just Jewish books, however. They were decadent books by people like Steinbeck and Hemingway and uh, D.H. Lawrence, other Americans and Brits who wrote decadent literature. Even emotional support, support, giving someone who was so depressed about their lives a hug, saying, I understand, I love you. This is kind of emotional support that can just give a little bit of energy for another person to keep on. And another very risky passive um, uh, resistance is like this example of the menorah, doing something very small to say, you won't kill my religion. You won't kill what makes me a human being, my spirit. The greatest act of passive resistance is the act of not denouncing a Jew. Many Christian Poles, Catholic Poles, knew that there were Jews hiding in the barn, at the edge of the forest, in someone's basement, and those who did not denounce those Jews were taking a huge risk. If the Germans thought you were helping Jews that in Poland, or what had been Poland and wasn't anymore, they would not only execute you, but your family, 
effectively your entire neighborhood. So not denouncing a Jew was not taking action. And that was a huge act of passive resistance. There was, however, very active resistance and there were women in the active resistance. Look at these women. They are wearing what they could beg, borrow or steal. If you came home from another town and you found that your neighborhood was empty of Jews and your house was empty of Jews, and you knew you had to run to the forest and join the partisans in order to survive, you couldn't make a stop at the local Partisans Are Us clothing store and pick up your outfit. You had to take what you could get. Sometimes that even meant taking a warm winter coat off of a dead Nazi. You can also see their weapons are kind of ramshackle. Again, they had to take what they could steal or find maybe a discarded broken rifle and use the parts to create other rifles. Note that little girl in the front row. Yes, there were little girls who helped it, the other women in the resistance and probably little boys, but my focus is on the females. I chose my title from Proverbs 31, a woman of valor more precious than rubies. And these women were robed in dignity and strength. And they faced what came with grace. Not every day, sometimes they could have an anxiety attack and have a meltdown, just like everybody else, because they were just like everybody else. But more times than not, when it was necessary, they were women of valor. Here are a few of their faces. Look at them and see. We know people that look like this. They are regular people. I was honored to meet several of them and have them in my books. And again, sorry about the photo quality. Take a minute and look at those faces. Some were actresses and their, and their photos were publicity shots. Some, the photos were taken in the field. Some were taken when they were arrested. There are some were posed studio shots, maybe for family or high school graduation. So many different reasons for these particular photos. And they all add up to one major photo, resist. And these women did resist. Here's a photo of Abno, Ab, Abna Kovner, I just lost my whole brain. Um, Abba Kovner, thank you. And he was the leader of the Avengers, the fierce partisan from Vilna, my ancestral home, Vilna, Lithuania. As you can see, again, they wore whatever they had, their weapons or whatever they could put together. Uh, Abba was originally a poet, an academic, very literary, and he became one of the fiercest most feared partisan leaders. He's in the center with all that black hair. This photo is one of the um, actions that were was taken by the partisans. What they would do is they would watch the train tracks from the forest or in hiding in a field. They would see when a train schedule would bring a train to a bridge. And then whoever was the fastest runner in the group would take a jar or a bottle and stuff it with a gasoline soaked rag with a little bit hanging out. And that person would run across the field uh, to the bridge, climb up, and then put that jar or, or two jars um, on the tracks. And then they would light what was the wick. And as these, these women told me, we would run like hell. And they would run back to hiding and wait because the train was on the way. And then they would watch the explosion. And uh, if it in fact were on a bridge, it was double uh, extra credit points because the bridge would be taken out as well. So on the left bottom, you see Schlafwagen and that's a sleeper car. It was critical to take these trains out because they were bringing supplies, materiel and personnel to the various German outposts in occupied Europe. 
Here are a few other examples of active resistance. Couriers were so important. They didn't have um, cell phones. Most of the time they didn't have any phone because it was forbidden. And so some of the partisans, particularly the women who were fleet of foot, would get a message from one partisan commandant and run through the forest, over the hills, uh, to the next camp. And uh, the next camp perhaps had a telegraph machine in the forest and could telegraph headquarters in Moscow with what was going on. Uh, perhaps it was intelligence about a German attack. And Moscow could do the same. They could let the partisans in the forest know when a supply plane was coming to land in some clearing, perhaps on ice, in the middle of the forest. And the partisans would then go to the site, they would have torches, and when they could hear the sound of this plane, they would light their torches at four corners of the clearing and hope that the pilot could land pretty much on a dime, which many times they did. And they would be bringing supplies, medications, blankets, um, an occasional doctor, and then they would take out uh, wounded partisans and uh, take them back to Moscow for medical care. Oh, sorry about that. All right, meetings. Having secret meetings to plan the partisan actions were very important. And sometimes they, they let people know by putting painting graffiti on a wall. And so people who were normally brought up to be studious, obedient, religious, law obeying, suddenly had become partisan, uh, partisan graffiti artists. And they had a code, they could paint it on a wall and as other partisans or their careers or their spies in the city or the ghetto would walk by, they would know we're meeting at 2 a.m. behind this particular mausoleum in this particular cemetery and they'd have a quick meeting. Another activity that women were particularly good at was breaking codes and most of it was in Morse code. And the Germans would again communicate important troop movements. And if these, these Jewish women could break the code, sometimes they were able to let the allies know in time. Now the Germans understood that this was going on. So with their inventiveness, they came up with antenna that could detect the uh, radio waves. And they had these antenna on little trucks or jeeps. And they would just drive up and down the streets of the ghetto or of the neighborhood in case people were outside of the ghetto doing it. And little kids, four or five years old, would be sitting outside the apartment building where the radio broadcasts were being transmitted. And they would have a pile of pebbles. And their job was to throw the pebbles up as high as they could and hit those windows as a signal to the radio operator that they better shut down fast and hide. They didn't have mimeograph machines or copiers. They had to rely on sneaking into offices and printing flyers of encouragement, of information, which they would disperse inside and outside the ghettos. Another act of active uh, resistance was smuggling. And of course they had to smuggle medications, food, uh, letters to people who were in hiding and they smuggled Jews in and out of the ghettos into safe hiding places, perhaps in the countryside. Now it might be a surprise to know that one active form of resistance was recreation in the camps and the ghettos in particular. If you could take a rock and throw it back and forth like a game of catch, or if you could play jump rope, or if you could draw with a stick in the sand, or if you could lead kids in a game, all of these things might get the endorphins going and might distract the children and the other teenagers from the horror that's around them. And in so doing, give them a little hope for the, the next day. It might surprise people to know that in the, in the ghettos and in the synagogues, there were schools of some sort. It was very important to the, the Jewish people to continue education. And they also had synagogues of a sort where they did what they could to recreate 
their traditions. Outside of the ghetto, the black market was thriving. And if, if a Jew had taken, perhaps was able to sneak in a, a gold ring into the ghetto, they could maybe reach out through the fence and a black marketer would take it and bring back, you know, maybe a, a rotten chicken uh, in exchange. Stealing food, weapons, medication, extremely important. So people who grew up to be law abiding had to become proficient at crime. And the irony is that, of course, there were Jew Jewish criminals, as there are in any group. And suddenly the thieves, the, the, the people that broke the law habitually, they became leaders because they knew how to do it. For Christian people, as well as Jews, a very, very important act of resistance was hiding and transporting Jews, smuggling them out, giving them um, a safe house, bringing food and medicine to them, taking messages back to other people in their families who were also in hiding, sometimes as long as two years, sometimes in those little dugouts underground, maybe behind a false wall in an attic like Anne Frank. One of the most challenging acts of active resistance was passing as Gentile, uh, particularly Catholic. If you were a woman and you had blonde hair or red hair, um, you could very possibly pass, but it was more than looks. You had to have identification papers. You had to have your records from your church, your baptism. You had to be able to speak the language the way the Christians spoke it. You couldn't have a Yiddish accent. You had to be able to come up with, uh, if you're questioned, recipes of your culture. So you had to know how to cook food that wasn't Jewish food per se. It was much more difficult for men. Uh, dark haired, dark eyed men didn't have a chance. Blonde haired, red haired Jewish men had a chance unless they had to pull their pants down because of circumcision. So they had to lay low. Their lives were always in danger. The women who passed as Catholics in particular, very often ended up employed by the Germans in their offices and had um, access to very important information that they were able to pass along. But the irony there is it could look to other Jews as if they were collaborators. Look at her, she's working with the Germans. They wouldn't have known that she was a spy for the partisans. So very difficult to decide who the good guys were. On that note, prostitution um, also provided opportunities for spying. And when you have no money and your children are starving, and the only way you can earn a living is by prostitution. It really isn't fair for people after the war to judge you, especially if you were a woman who had to do that and in the course of servicing uh, Germans was able to elicit important information and pass it along. Unfortunately, many of those women after the war were pointed out, denounced, forced to march down the streets with their heads shaven, sometimes with their clothes taken off and a sign saying German collaborator. Of course, the most powerful uh, act of resistance is violence. Again, it's something that Jews are not normally brought up. They don't go out for target practice with their dads or hunting usually, and they had to become proficient in violence and many did. Another act of resistance that would be unexpected is the act of escaping from a camp. How on earth could you escape from the double fences and the electrified barbed wire? But there were escapes. There were tunnels that were built in particular. There were people who worked in the kitchens who were able to hide in, in um, cans of garbage that were loaded on trucks. There were escapes. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Another form of active resistance was sponsored by the Polish organization Zygota, which most people have not heard of because it was highly secret. Zygota was an organization that was, was sponsored by the Polish government in exile. 
don't forget, there was no Poland. There was only the German general government and for a while, the Soviet um, sector that was occupied until the Germans broke the pact and invaded the Soviet section. Zagoda was a secret organization specifically designed to save Jews. It was supported by the Polish government in exile with very little, if any, support from the other countries, including the United States. If you've ever heard of Irina Sendler, she was the Polish social worker who would sneak into the ghetto to save Jewish babies. She worked with Zygota. They saved thousands of Jews. And these two monuments of many um, are to the people of Zygota. Many, of course, were caught and executed. The one on the left is from Łódź, which is spelled L-O-D-Z. And it looks like it should be Łódź, but it's Łódź. And the one in the upper right is in Warsaw. It began as the Polish Council to aid the Jews. It was part of the underground Polish resistance. I want to emphasize that the camps, the ghettos in the former Poland were not Polish. They were not Polish concentration camps. They were German. They, they contained Polish prisoners. It isn't accurate to say the Polish concentration camps. Uh, and so I hope that we can bring a light to that darkness of that information. Poland no longer existed and it had only been about 18 years old at the time. It only was reconstituted after 123 years of not being a country. It was only reconstituted after the Treaty of Versailles. And by 1939, it was already under attack. It was like a teenage country. And they had the wherewithal to go into exile. The French also had a government under de Gaulle in exile in England. And now I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about Faye. Look at her eyes. Her eyes are riveting. You can't take your eyes off of her eyes. And even when she was a high schooler, those eyes, they were amazing. She's wearing medals from many countries, uh, medals of honor from many countries in Europe, um, as well as Canada where she settled and Israel. The picture of her um, in high school was taken by her older brother, Moish, who because he was not allowed to go to college at that time, they didn't let Jewish boys into college, he went to another town nearby and was trained to become a photographer. And he practiced on Faye and he made that gorgeous portrait. He also taught Faye as much as he could and she became like his apprentice, learning the photography trade. And she learned at a young age how to run a business um, and learn many, many skills that would suit her later as a partisan. Faye Shulman, my friend, had hoped to be with us tonight as she was with every Zoom presentation I made, but sadly she left us on April 24th this year. Whenever I was making a presentation in person or by Zoom, I would let her know. And she always asked me to please say hello and to thank the audience for their interest in Holocaust education and her story. The biggest quote, the biggest thing she wanted to emphasize was we didn't go silently like sheep. There was resistance and how she can prove it was she became a partisan photographer and she buried duplicates of every picture she took so that they could be recovered in the future. I have pictures, I have proof. When she in fact joined the partisans after running away from the Nazis, she had stolen from German offices some of their cameras and their amazing, very modern film and equipment and chemicals. Look at this beautiful photo and the detail in it. Again, all different um, uniforms, all different weapons. I put a circle around the first aid kit 
because when Faye got to the partisans in the middle of one horrific night, they said, um, oh, well, we heard that your brother-in-law was a doctor, so we think you should be the medic. And Faye said, fine. And she thought to herself, I don't know anything about medicine. And I hate the sight of blood. It makes me throw up. But nevertheless, when your commandant says, we heard that you're going to be our medic, you go, right, absolutely. He also said, because they had advanced, informa advanced information, that you're a photographer and we hope that you will take pictures to prove what happened. And so Faye would say, whenever I went into um, combat, I would take three things. I would take my rifle, I would take my first aid kit, and I would take my camera. And very often when there was a lull in the fighting, she would set up a tripod, set up her, ca her camera on it and have one of the guys push the button and take pictures while bullets were flying or have, if they had just stopped. In the center, the man with his hands kind of folded together um, was their camp surgeon who by trade was a veterinarian. Here's one of the first formal posed shots um, that Faye took. It's fascinating on many levels. One, the composition is evocative of the flag planting on Iwo Jima, which of course hadn't happened yet, so she didn't copy it. But also the composition shows the horizontal so beautifully parallel and the verticals, the trees were already parallel in the background. How beautiful is that? What's really remarkable is look at those weapons. They don't look like they were stolen or put together from spare parts because they had just come back from a raid on a German um, outpost and they had stolen these brand new shiny weapons. Well, speaking of weapons, here's Faye in her fabulous leopard fur coat and showing us her beautiful form with, with her rifle. I'm going to tell you a little story about that fur coat. When I first saw it, all I could imagine was the glamour of a movie star, even Loretta Young, if you're my age and remember Loretta Young, sashaying through an open door in a glorious dress or fur coat. And so I wasn't even interested in the weapon. And I asked her, you know, like, what's up with the fur coat? And she said, well, when she was a young teenager working for her brother, she was able, he paid her and she was able to save up enough money to buy a fur coat, but they were very cheap because her town, Lenin, which was not named for Vladimir, their town, Lenin, was on the border with Russia. And trucks would all, uh, often come across with goods to sell in the market in Lenin. And very, very popular were the furs that the Russians were able to bring. So it wasn't expensive, it was gorgeous, and it kept her warm in those terrible winters in the forest. But there's another story about Faye, Faye, Faye and her coat is before she went to the partisans, when the Germans invaded and occupied Lenin, one of the first things they did besides build the ghetto was to confiscate everybody's valuables and they took her coat. So when she first uh, went, she didn't have it, but it is going to appear later. After she was with the partisans, for just a couple of weeks, the commandant said, well, it's time for us to go attack Lenin. The Germans are all living in all of our houses and uh, have taken the place over and we need to raid it and utterly destroy it. And Faye, you're so new, um, maybe you don't want to go. It's your town. If you don't wanna go, you don't have to. We know you're tough. And she said, no, I'll be helpful because I know every inch of the place and it's my responsibility. So I'm going to go with you. And they trudged several hours out of the forest to Lenin. They took up their positions around the perimeter. And on signal, just as dawn was breaking, they launched a virulent attack 
on Lenin, totally surprising the Germans. Um, and they pretty much wiped them out. During a lull in the fighting, Faye said to a couple of her close buddies, you know, I still have some equipment at my home. I think I'm going to go there and see if I can get it. And they said, we'll go with you. And so they, in a lull, just like they're taking a walk, walked from wherever they were talking over to Faye's house. And there was her beautiful home that her father had built that had contained so many warm family memories. And the, the dark room that her brother had used in the house, of course, was empty. The whole house was empty. And her comrades said, Faye, we're gonna have to burn it down. Do you wanna just go ahead, ahead of us and we'll catch up? And she said, no, it's my house. I'm the one that should do it. And she lit a match and set her beautiful home on fire. Afterwards, she said to the, her comrades, you know, there was a girl that was assisting me uh, when I was taking pictures for the Germans. And I think she probably took all of the equipment. Let's go over to her house. So they went for a walk in the dark with the ash, with gunfire, with flames, with screaming. They took a walk over to the girl's house and outside were boxes. And when Faye and the comrades opened the boxes, they found all of her camera equipment and some family photos. So they were getting ready to pick them up and go on back to the camp when around the corner behind them, a woman seemed to appear out of the fog and she was walking toward them. Nobody said anything, nobody made eye contact. And as she passed Faye, she handed Faye a bundle and kept on walking. Faye opened the bundle and guess what was in it? The fur coat and hat. How did that woman get it? From the Germans. No one will ever know. But Faye, very soon after getting into the partisans, ended up with her fur, fur coat again. When I think about that story, the juxtaposing of horror and serendipity is, is so, it's almost like a whiplash to my soul to see those two things combined. And it happened so often. Faye set this shot up on the tripod and had one of her comrades push the button. Okay, so nothing's happening and I don't know why. So I'm gonna do this, that's not happening. I'm gonna stop share for a minute, except I can't. So Justin, are you here to help? I am, let me see if I can, whoop. Oh, oh, thank you. There we go. <laughs> thank you, whatever you did, you're a miracle worker. A few days after they burned down the home, Faye and her closest comrades came back to see the destruction. As you can see, the composition again of this photo is extraordinary. In the background are the only things remaining from her house, the vertical posts of the chimneys, of the fireplaces, and the ruins of Lenin behind. In front, she has her four comrades, also parallel verticals, and they're standing in front of a tree. And I think the V of the tree, the V for victory, probably caught Faye's eye. And in the foreground, you see the graves of three German Christian soldiers who must have died somehow during the partisan attack. Another fascinating photo is of their surgery center in the forest. And later on, when I tell you about Miriam, she also was part of the surgery center. Who would ever imagine clinics in swamps? They did, they did raids on local hospitals so that they would have white coats and equipment. And they created operating tables, as you can see, out of branches. In the back, upper right, oops, upper left, the man's head had just been bandaged by Faye. You can see her in the center, she's smiling. It's not because she's happy. Somebody must have just said something like, oh, we're gonna be able to save this guy's leg or some good news. 
which is why she was smiling. She also set this shot up. And again, I'm taken by her eye with the verticals and the horizontals. Beautiful composition. After the war, Faye met Morris. And as you can see, they fell madly in love. What a glorious, gorgeous couple. And what a beautiful shot. I think her brother Moish, who also survived, uh, was able to take this beautiful portrait of them. And she still has that coat. After they married, they lived for three years in a displaced persons camp in Landsberg, Germany. They had hoped to be able to go to Palestine and help build the country. And they were very active in, in smuggling arms and weapons um, to Palestine, to the Jews in Palestine at that time. But they got pregnant and in 1946, their daughter Susan was born. And by the time they were able to leave, it was too dangerous to go to Palestine. So they emigrated to Canada. Here's one of my favorite pictures and no professional took it. I asked Faye if she would hold this photo of her high school graduation photo so that I could take this picture in my own little way and allow viewers to compare those gorgeous eyes. If you would like more information on Faye, and I hope you will, you can contact the Jewish Partisan Foundation in San Francisco. They now have a worldwide traveling exhibit of the photos that she was able to retrieve, that she had buried while she was in the partisan, that she was able to retrieve after the war. And they created this fabulous traveling exhibit. And I'm sure it could come to your wonderful museum. Also, there are a couple of videos featuring Faye. One was done by my friend, Shelly Saywall. And when Faye was in her 70s, Shelly had found out about her. No stories had been written. No one had heard of her. She found out about her while she was researching the partisans. She said, oh no, a woman? I can't believe it. And she contacted Faye and they got to know each other. And she said, Faye, I'm a documentarian. Let's go back to Poland and, to, and do a reunion with your comrades. Wouldn't that be great? And Faye said, no, under no circumstances will I set foot in that blood-soaked cemetery of Yiddishkeit, the cemetery of Jewish life. Nope, not going. Shelley kept after her for 10 years. And Faye finally said, okay, fine, I'll go. And they went back with their crew to the places in Poland where Faye had lived and where she had fought. And they had this extraordinary reunion with very elderly comrades. It is a priceless, precious video. And I'm going to share information with Michael about how he can access it for you. My next person is Miriam, the little girl who went to live with the partisans. Why? Because when they were stuck in the brutal Lida Poland ghetto, in the middle of one night, her father was outside because he was a surgeon and he was allowed to go practice surgery on Nazis in the hospital outside the ghetto. And there had been an emergency that had kept him late. So he was coming home late at night into the ghetto with the death and the starvation and the freezing and the disease and every kind of horror. And he's walking home and he felt a hand on his arm and he thought, that's it, they're going to kill me now. And he turned around and it was two huge partisans and they should not have been there, started to whisper to him saying, Dr. Miasmic, we need a surgeon in the forest and we're taking you with us. We have orders from the commandant not to come back without you. And little Dr. Miasmic said, uh, no, I'm not going without my wife and daughter. 
And the partisans said, uh, no, we don't take women and children. And they continued to argue in whispered tones or they would have been caught and executed. And finally, the little David wore down the Goliath of the partisans. And they said, fine, we'll, we'll take you tomorrow night, have them ready. And your little girl better not cause any trouble. And so the next night they packed little satchels and they met the partisans who helped them cut. Uh, they'd already cut the barbed wire. They escaped hours and hours through the snow over a frozen river that of course broke and they all were plunged into the, the freezing water. The partisan had to carry Miriam on his shoulders while he was swimming. They get to the partisan camp. Everybody's irritated. What's up with the woman and the little girl? But Dr. Myasnik said, we're, we're a package and my, my daughter will act like a boy and work like a boy. She will never cry. She will never cause you any problems. And they accepted them. In the summer of 1939, with no idea that their lives were about to change, the Myasniks were a very well-off, comfortable family. He was a famous surgeon. They went to resorts. They had picnics in the parks. And here's Miriam, she's only four, with that bow that's bigger than she is, having her picture taken. When I look at this, it just brings tears to my eyes because they have no clue what's about to befall them. And what was about to befall them was the Blitz. Here's a shot from Warsaw. Dr. Myasnik had gone to um, another town uh, for a couple of days. And Miriam and her mom were getting ready for dinner when the bombs started. And her mom grabbed her and rushed her down the stairs of their apartment building and down the street through the mayhem to a bomb shelter in the basement of another apartment. And it was like all of these people were flooding down the stairs and crowding there. And they, they sat shoulder to shoulder. There was no room. Fortunately, Miriam and her mother were able to get a spot uh, by a wall, so at least they had some support. And the whistling of the bombs kept coming closer and closer. And every time they would see the whistling, everybody would scream or pray or hold their breath or just whimper. Well, as the whistles got closer and closer, finally one hit the apartment building uh, above them. And of everyone just took in their own breath knowing they were going to die. That was it. The building was going to collapse on them. And if they survived the collapse, they would suffocate. So this looked like it was the end. But a couple of teenage boys, because we know how teenage boys are, said, well, we're not going to sit here forever and wonder. We're going to go find out what happened. So they went out and they went in the front door of the apartment building and the stairs were still there. And the apartments were still there. And they climbed up to the top floor and the bomb had gone through the roof and landed in the bathtub of one of the bathrooms. Now, this may not look like a bomb in a bathtub to you, but an artist friend of mine read the galleys of my book and said, I would like to do some drawings um, for you to include. And this is his interpretation of the bomb in the bathtub. It almost looks like he's waiting for someone to come scrub his back. We think, well, we've been told that the people in that apartment had filled the bathtub with water because they knew that the pipes would be broken and then they would have some water if the apartment survived. Someone said, well, that's why the bomb didn't explode. But I don't think a bathtub full of water would have stopped an explosion. I think it was just a bad bomb. The next day, Miriam and her mother had to get out of town and they had to hop a train and go from Warsaw to Lida, where her father and uncles were. They had a house there. And her mom told her, you may not speak. It's gonna be 22 hours, you may not speak because if these people hear Yiddish, they'll know we're Jews. We're taking off our armbands at that time. It was armbands, not yellow stars yet. And uh, we're just gonna pretend we're not Jewish. And Miriam didn't peep. And they went on that train ride and reunited with um, their other relatives in Lida. 
They stayed in Lida for about two years under Soviet control until the Germans forced them into that awful ghetto um, that they were going to escape from, but they didn't know it. Here's a shot of what a typical ghetto looked like. People aren't really sure of what's happening, these pictures being taken. The Germans took a lot of pictures in their files. They wanted a record of what they did. And then again, um, there was a rumor one day that the Germans were going to come and take all the children. They had done that in several other camps, had just taken the children and killed them. And the doctor who was out of the ghetto in the hospital had heard that. And there was a woman, a farm lady, a Catholic farm lady, whose daughter's life he had saved. And he asked her if she would save his daughter. And they smuggled Miriam out into the countryside and the woman uh, gave her a home. So from the death and the starvation and everything in the ghetto, Miriam suddenly was out in the country at a wonderful farmhouse with all the food, the animals, and the farm lady's little girl to play with. It was an idyllic experience. After a while, however, she began to miss her family so much that she stopped eating and all she could do was cry. So she was there about a month and then her parents decided the rumor, the, what the Germans were gonna do was a rumor and she could come back. She willfully went back to the ghetto, potentially to die. And when I was growing up in a Jewish community, uh, a suburb of Detroit, uh, the mothers of some of my friends did exactly the same thing. They had been able to get out of the Warsaw ghetto through the sewage sewers out into the regular city because they were blonde and steal food and take it back. And I would ask them, why, why did you go back? And they looked at me like there was something wrong with me. My family was there. My mother was there. Of course I went back. Now this, if you were on a quiz show, probably a couple of you would be able to figure out what this was. When Miriam and her parents got to the camp, the partisan camp, they saw these mounds. The mounds were the top of dugouts. They are called Zemlyankas, sorry, Zemlyankas. And they are dugouts that could sleep one, two, some were big enough for 15 or 16. And in the winter, they were covered with snow and rocks and branches. And in the summer, they were covered with grasses and rocks and branches. This one in particular, this drawing shows that there is kind of a makeshift door, but very often it was just a piece of burlap or canvas or an animal skin, the Zemlyanka. And Miriam and her family, her parents ended up living in a series of Zemlyankas as they moved from camp to camp. Here again, with apologies about the film quality, I just wanted you to get a little idea. Uh, this isn't one of Faye's photos uh, of how crowded and dark the forest was. It was so dense. It, it reminded me when I heard of it, of the stories I used to hear about the elephant grass in Vietnam when the guys were trying to hack their way through. There really were no paths. You couldn't see much more than 10 feet in any direction. Here is an image of what the partisans look like. They were tough guys. These were on lookout duty. They were far away from their camp looking for Germans. And one of the things that little Miriam was good at was scurrying up the trees, tall trees, and being a lookout um, up at the top of the trees. And if she saw a fire or smoke or saw a train arriving or the random German group, she would scurry down and let the partisans know. Another job she had was collecting twigs and fire, uh, firewood so that the staff in the hospital could boil water for cleaning, sterilizing the surgical instruments and bandages, which had to be reused. Um, let's see. She also, in the winter, would gather snow. And it was interesting to me that life was better in the freezing winter than it was in the summer which I never would have guessed because then they had clean snow for water. In the summer, they had to dig for water and it contained bugs and filth and debris. And they had to strain it repeatedly and then uh, boil it. So water was easier to come by in the um, winter. 
After liberation, she and her family were also in the Soviet sector. And Miriam at that point was like a feral wolf child. She was really good at a lot of things that weren't gonna do her any good in a city. And one of the things that she was not good at was sitting in a desk like a little lady in a school. So she skipped school. She wasn't going. She still had her gun in her holster and she still kept her hair short and dressed like a boy. And she would swagger up and down the streets of their little city until so one day, a Soviet soldier saw her and he thought, hmm, a little kid with a gun, maybe I should do something. So he approached her and he said, uh, you need to give me that gun. And she stood up straight and said, no way, I'm a partisan. We never surrender our weapons. And he was going to laugh, but he spared her dignity. And he explained to her that he had to take it, it was the law. And so she gave it up and she started crying. And she ran home and that was the first time her mother had seen her crying since before the war. She was crying because she feels she had felt she had failed. She had betrayed the partisans, her family and the Jewish people. And her mother hugged her and said, it's not all that bad because there are still Soviet partisans fighting in other places in Europe and they need that gun. So here's Miriam. After the war, they finally escaped the USSR by foot, by train, by truck. They crisscrossed Europe any way they could over the course of a year. They stayed in many displaced persons camps. They finally reached Rome where they stayed for two years. They put Miriam in school. She was bad at it still. Plus it was an Italian, one of the languages she didn't, didn't speak. They were able to get permission to come to the States in February, 1947, just a month before she would turn 12. She was so excited about coming to the States as were her parents. They'd be free. No one would be killing Jews. She would be able to finally um, not be afraid. Maybe she could be a kid again. But she came to the States. She came to Brooklyn. And the girls were mean to her. They were the original mean girls. They laughed at the way she looked. They laughed at the haunted look in her eye. They laughed at the way she dressed. You're just a dirty refugee. You're a greenie, a greenhorn. She didn't understand things like Thanksgiving or Frank Sinatra. They just thought she was the dumbest, filthiest refugee. And that's how they treated her. The teachers weren't nice to her either because of course she couldn't read or understand English, even though she could speak five other languages and could maybe save your life if you were attacked. She couldn't do school stuff. She was forced to continue with school, however, as traumatic as it was. And she fooled the teachers and she fooled, fooled the other girls. She learned English. And she learned about how to be a teenager in the States. Here she is at her 13th birthday. I hope you can see her beaming in happiness that her uncle had given her American girl blue jeans to wear. They had little felt pockets with flowers on them and a t-shirt and a cap. She finally looked like an American girl and she was thrilled. Well, not only did she graduate high school on time, even though she really didn't start school till she was 12, she went on to college, grad school and earned a PhD she became a noted scientist and a medical school professor. When she retired in her 70s, she became a writer, and I'm grateful to have been her editor, um, and she became an artist. The first work she did for about the next 15 years was all Holocaust related. Here's an example. She, shows, she takes a graphic design that's already in existence and superimposes another that has emotional content. This mother and child in a ghetto are superimposed on a ghetto wall that was made of not bricks, but stones that were stolen from Jewish cemeteries. Madonna and child. Here we are last November, oh, November uh, 2019, at the book launch of a miracle uh, victory for Miriam. 
And Miriam's story shows that Jewish heroines come in all sizes and all ages. And Miriam, like Faye, always asks me to say hello to the audience and thank the audience for their interest. And she is still with us and she was very excited about this presentation tonight. Here are two more pieces of her art, her Holocaust related art. The one on the left is self-explanatory, a woman screaming in the ghetto or the camp. But on the right is the last photo she saw of her grandparents as she waved goodbye to them in Warsaw. You, you might not be able to see that it is superimposed over the Vistula River and there's a little red rowboat in it, which is reminiscent of all the wonderful picnics and rowboat rides they had had before the war. And you can see her grandparents dissolving to show that their lives were lost in the Warsaw ghetto. Here are four of the books that we worked together on. In the center is her memoir, Amidst the Shadows of Trees. Above it is the poetry book, uh, The Scroll of Remembrance. It takes its name from the Torah scroll in Jewish culture. On the left, the stones weep is quite remarkable. It is a Holocaust art educator book done in conjunction with Margaret Lincoln, a master Holocaust educator. They created Holocaust lesson plans, introducing high school kids to the Holocaust through Miriam's art. And it has been vetted to meet the standards and every lesson plan in there has been submitted by teachers who used uh, Miriam's information. It's very powerful if you know any Holocaust educators, it would be a very helpful book. Um, and on the right, etched in my memory, another poetry and photo book by Miriam. Now we come to our cover again, which has special meaning to me because my granddaughter, who's 17 now, when she was 12, I was telling her Miriam's story. And I said, you know, we're gonna write this book and we have to come up with a wonderful cover that just tells the story in the cover. And my granddaughter said, I'll be right back. And I thought, well, that's rude. We're having a conversation here. And she went into my office and pulled out some paper and pencil and she sketched a design of a little Miriam facing David and Goliath like a huge threatening swastika. My granddaughter came up with the concept for this cover when she was 12. She knew my grandmother's stories. She knew the stories of my other women of valor and in her soul was able to process Miriam's story. I then gave the concept to a professional uh, graphic designer who created this cover. In her later years, Miriam has started doing celebration of life art, not art of the Holocaust. And when she painted this picture, I'll put it together graphically, excuse me, I couldn't help noticing the contrast between our cover. They both have a figure facing away from the, the uh, audience, while the one in victory is defiant with her hands on her hips. The one in the more contemporary art is exultant, is celebratory. The colors are kind of similar. You've got the oranges in there. And I thought that was an important partnership. And so in, as I get to the closing, I always like to use Rabbi Niemöller's very famous poem. Most of us only have heard one stanza of it. And this is the, the whole thing. Uh, rabbi, a rabbi, Pastor Niemöller was a German Christian minister and he helped Jews in Germany. He was caught, he was arrested and sent to concentration camp. He did survive. And when he was let out, he spent the rest of his life dedicated to Holocaust education. And here's what he wrote, a message to all of us to think about what would we have done back then? They came first for the communists and I wasn't a communist, so I didn't speak up. Then they came for the trade unionists and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. 
then they came for me. And by that time, no one was left to speak up. Who do we speak up for? Who speaks up for us? What would you have done had you been a teenager? What would you have done if you were young parents with little kids? What would you do now if you're grandparents? We all have different strengths and weaknesses. We're living in very turbulent times that call for active participation in what will be our future and our children and grandchildren's future. What are we doing now? I hope, like Anne Frank, we are each trying to bring a little light that will both defy and define the darkness. Thank you so much for your attention. I know that was a long time to sit. If you are interested in my work, you might purchase Women of Valor, Polish Jewish Resistors to the Third Right, or, or and A Victory for Miriam, the little Jewish girl who defied the Nazis. And in 2022, Women of Valor, German, French, and Dutch Resistors to the Third Right. Please do email me for further information. It's down in the bottom right-hand corner or see my website uh, for the other things that are going on in my work. Once again, thank you, Justin, for saving us technologically and Michael for inviting me and all of you who have sat through a very long presentation. I hope it brought some light. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, Thank you. Great, great presentation. Thank you uh, very much.